Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning in some part of our uh, of the world. I think in, in Estonia is still uh, a bright morning, if we could say that. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us in our fourth uh, lecture series, um, the Center for Strategic and Global Studies lecture series in uh, IR. Of course, uh, the the terminology post COVID, uh, the the coronavirus. But then we will have a, a interesting discussion. Before we we had a discussion on European Union and how the EU responds to the crisis. We also have a comparison with the ASEAN. Uh, we also have the last discussion we had is on, well, it was on a this disaster management and what uh, we can learn from that kind of management to our uh, future uh, possible crisis or pandemic. Today we have a very interesting topic uh, since one of the country that uh, suffered the most, at least the most well, uh, the third, uh, the the third biggest uh, positive cases in the world right now, Russia, and uh, it is very interesting uh, case since just two days ago, Russia uh, organized this Victory Day, uh, a very momentous or large event, delayed from the initial plan. Uh, many people thought it would be cancelled, but at, at actually just moved to uh, a more convenient time, if we could say that. And then we, Russia will also have one, um, another event next week uh, on the constitutional referendum. And to talk about that, we have a very distinguished speaker, my professor, my colleagues from John Sutte Institute of uh, Political Studies, Professor Andrei Makarchev. Uh, thank you for joining us, Andre. <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Andre has written a lot about the biopolitics, about, oh, well, actually about a lot of things, but I'm most interested in whenever he speaks about biopolitics. Uh, I remember listening to him uh, several years ago in, in Tbilisi and also in our institute uh, talking about biopolitics. And the last two uh, written pieces that I've read is about biopolitics of the crisis. I think you, you, you've you written about that in Ponar's uh, website as well. And the last one is about how, how this kind of uh, crisis uh, either forced the government to, or, or prompted the government to, to do something uh, as a form of crisis management. But then there is also this kind of uh, uh, try to legitimate, to, uh, legitimize their policy or their strategy. So we will listen to Andre's uh, talk in the first session. Um, I'll give the floor to Andre. <clears throat> so, yeah, you can start your share screen. Uh, do you see my slides? No. Uh, not yet, but you okay. can start. Uh, yeah, you can click mm -hmm. the screen again, yeah. So now you should see, right? Uh, um, Yes, now we are, yes, we, we, we see. That. And you can also see me. Okay, thank you very, uh, very much, uh, Radito, for uh, inter in introducing me to, the, to this global audience. Uh, as I see, we have a group of people coming from different countries, from different uh, uh, backgrounds, and I kind of anticipate a very interesting conversation on this topic. Uh, this is my first visit to Indonesia. Uh, While well, it's virtual, of course, uh, and it's gonna be quite short, one hour and a half. Uh, of which uh, I will uh, present the topic uh, in, uh, let's say, 30, 35, 40 minutes. And then, again, I will be happy to open the floor uh, for, uh, for discussion, questions and answers, uh, etc. <clears throat> Indeed, one of the uh, fields of my interest uh, uh, is uh, the concept of biopolitics, uh, which is an academic, uh, an academic term, academic notion, that uh, uh, quite strongly and forcefully uh, interfered into the sphere of uh, uh, public policy and uh, practical politics. A concept that uh, only a few years ago uh, was basically considered as uh, relatively abstract 
and very much embedded in uh, European political philosophy with such big names as Michel Foucault and uh, George Agamben, to give just a couple of them, uh, became uh, a matter of everyday lives uh, all across uh, um, uh, the globe. And that's exactly uh, what I'm interested in uh, in, my, um, in my own research. And I will be happy to share some of my, uh, some of my findings uh, with, uh, uh, with you. Uh, uh, and, um, of course, uh, uh, I think I should need to start with uh, uh, some very brief uh, uh, introduction of uh, biopolitics as a concept. Uh, it's like biopolitics in five minutes, but I'll try to, uh, try to make it uh, quite, uh, quite fast. Uh, when we uh, speak about biopolitics in, uh, from, let's say, perspective of political science and uh, comparative politics, international relations, political sociology, uh, I would uh, single out uh, at least the three clusters of questions that I think are the most important for, uh, for biopolitics. I'm not going to uh, explain in uh, details, uh, you know, the, the history of biopolitical thinking and the trajectories of uh, biopolitics as, in, as, as a concept. I'll just uh, highlight uh, these three major, uh, major questions that are core for biopolitical knowledge and biopolitical expertise. And all of them will be related to my uh, talk on Russia, of course, so I will try to uh, make these uh, connections a little bit later. So the first question which I'm interested in is how political actors uh, build, construct their strategies on uh, issues related to bodily lives, to uh, different matters uh, that otherwise might be considered as uh, deeply private, such as, for example, sexuality or reproductive behavior, gender issues. Uh, and some of them are public, like healthcare, medicine, uh, demographics, uh, including even uh, penitentiary institutions. Uh, which is about taking freedom from uh, people and confining them into, uh, into spaces with limited mobilities, uh, etc. So how political strategies appear, how they emerge based uh, not on ideologies, not on economic uh, uh, premises, uh, but on uh, issues related to life and death. And what comes uh, as a result of that? Is it nationalism that uh, uh, kind of colonizes and uh, plays uh, first fiddle in uh, this uh, cluster of different ideologies? Is it racism, which also might have some biopolitical uh, uh, connotations? Is it an imperial policy that uh, pops up uh, uh, due to these strategies? Or maybe right-wing populism? That is one of the uh, most well-studied uh, political uh, political phenomena all across uh, the globe, especially in uh, the western uh, the western part. And I will just come back uh, later to populism, which, in my view, is a very biopolitical phenomenon because usually populism is about uh, managing of human bodies and differentiating between our bodies from uh, strangers or aliens or those who do not belong here. So that's one cluster of questions. Uh, another uh, question would be whether these biopolitical discourses and practices are conducive to the appearance of new biopolitical subjects, like new political groups that might have their voices in biopolitical uh, debates, either a space uh, for, let's say, new speaking positions uh, on that. And of course, the COVID-19 gives plenty of examples of new political uh, subjects that appear on the basis of kind of, you know, medical knowledge. Uh, that is uh, not just purely academic, uh, uh, academic stuff or scientific stuff. It's a matter of everyday life, and for many people, it's a matter of survival. So uh, that's, uh, that's the second question. And the third question is uh, how biopolitics relates to uh, appearance of new hierarchies, of new differentiations between different lives. Because there is a utopian understanding of uh, you know, universal value of each human lives. And we know that from the liberal perspective, of course, each life matters equally, just because this is about human beings. But when we uh, look at the practice and dig deeper, we'll see that all those political strategies, they do have inside of them a kind of differentiation between ours and non-ours, those who belong and those who do not belong, or those who belong but not fully, 
So it's always about inclusion and exclusion. It's always about protected lives. Uh, I mean, citizens who have rights. And uh, what uh, the Italian political philosopher Giorgio Agamben called bare life or naked life, life on its own, life within, uh, or, I mean, I'm saying, um, I mean uh, beyond, uh, uh, beyond sovereign protection, etc. What uh, appeared uh, due to the COVID uh, uh, emergency, it's a new type of biopolitical differentiation between those who are worse of living and those who are kind of doomed to death because of age because of some uh, pre-existing conditions, because they uh, were uh, living unhealthy lifestyles and they are to some extent guilty for uh, the poor state of their health, etc. Et, 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 et so if you look at different biopolitical discourses, you can find uh, new lines or new boundaries uh, that differentiate human lives, which I think uh, is uh, quite problematic from, uh, from many, uh, many respects. Uh, if we look at the uh, implications uh, or different trajectories of biopolitics through the lens of international relations scholarship, by our scholarship, we'll see that uh, the importance and the validity, and to some extent even the popularity, if I may say so, of biopolitical knowledge was always uh, dependent on uh, political conditions and political circumstances and political developments and even specific political events. So it was like, you know, ups and downs always. If we start with uh, the, uh, the founding father of the concept of the French political philosopher, Michel Foucault, uh, well, for him, biopolitics was very close related to liberalism. So uh, biopolitics was considered as an interesting, in, intrinsic part of liberalism and the, the newest version of liberalism, which is known as the neoliberalism. And uh, for Foucault, biopolitics was always positive, always productive. So the state, the liberal state, was just encouraging people to take care of their lives, to protect themselves against the possible risks and diseases, to invest into their body. So it was a productive part. It was not repressive. It was productive because it was, again, very much connected to the idea of uh, uh, liberalism. And Foucault is also known for, for a concept of responsabilization, which basically means a liberal attitude to human bodies as your own possession. So it's not a possession of the state, it's your body and you are supposed to, you, you are, you're supposed to behave as a responsible citizen. And again, looking at that from the perspective of the COVID-19, I think these countries that do have a culture of responsible behavior, they definitely went through this uh, uh, emergency, I would say in a little bit better shape than those countries uh, in which the idea of personal responsibility is a little bit uh, uh, less certain and more problematic. So that's a liberal understanding of politics. Now what happened next is uh, kind of a series of events that reversed this uh, uh, liberal logic of biopolitics. And that started with 9-11 in the United States with the uh, revival of the concept of state of exception uh, from uh, Carl Schmitt to George Agamben. And from the political side, the most important here was the idea that the state of exception uh, blurs uh, lines between democracies and non-democracies, because all of them kind of act uh, more or less equally when it comes to anti-terrorist measures. So there is no space for you know, this universal differentiation. The United States, especially the Guantanamo uh, prison uh, was uh, used by many uh, biopolitical authors as a kind of uh, uh, validation of this idea that liberal democracies uh, tend to act in a very illiberal way when it comes to their securities. Then in 2015, we've had a refugee crisis, another biopolitical, uh, let's say, uh, biopolitical event, biopolitical cycle, because the refugee crisis, of course, clearly raised the issue of, uh, let's say, locals versus non-locals. And uh, at this point, uh, it was another big name, George Agamben, who became increasingly popular due to his idea of the camp, which is basically a metaphor, uh, which denotes a new kind of state of liberal democracies in which the only way of governing this uh, you know, increasingly multicultural uh, uh, society would be through you know, through some kind of uh, 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 strict measures of control, surveillance, everything that is understood by, by the camp. Again, the camp does not sound 
very liberal uh, in, in, in this way. And uh, that's why the idea of the camp as allegedly the future of the West was uh, used by the left-wing critics of global uh, liberalism and uh, the idea of globalization, et cetera, et cetera. Now we've had a new wave of populism, uh, which is another, uh, another event that raised the, you know, the visibility and the attention to, to biopolitics. Uh, and there is already concept of biopopulism, which basically means that if you look at what populists want, what they uh, are trying to achieve, we'll see clear biopolitical distinctions. Again, the same biopolitical distinction that existed uh, before, but in a more kind of you know, sharpened and more reactualized uh, way. Again, the key here is the idea of inclusion and, and, and exclusion of others. And now we have a COVID, which I think is important in this debate, in this series of, uh, of, of events, because uh, the COVID-19 might be uh, uh, interpreted as a new step away from the liberal order uh, towards something different, something uh, not necessarily illiberal, but uh, I would prefer post-liberal, something which is much less about uh, values and much more about uh, safety and protection of uh, human life that might imply surveillance technologies and that might imply new ways of uh, you know, controlling human behavior and imposing restrictions and all these things with, that all the countries uh, went through. Uh, so if we look at uh, the COVID-19 from biopolitical perspective, uh, I would say that the, the major contribution that is uh, visible so far, and of course we are, as uh, Radito mentioned from the very beginning, we are maybe in the middle of the, of, 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 uh, of the global pandemic and uh, we are in the anticipation of a second wave, et cetera, et cetera. So the story is not over. Uh, but what is more or less uh, uh, visible is a clear prominence in the political debate <clears throat> of two sources of knowledge. One is medicine and another is statistics. And that's exactly these two types of, 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 of knowledge, uh, of hard knowledge that dominate political debate. Medicine, well, because people are dying, and statistics, because people want to project uh, situations uh, and these curves in, in, in other countries to their own countries. And that's why medical governance and statistical governance are becoming increasingly uh, prominent when it, when it comes to, uh, the, you know, uh, when it comes to governance. And uh, uh, this is uh, what is very close to the concept that have been developing before the COVID, like, for example, algorithmic governance. I like very much this uh, you know, idea of governance as a set of technical measures uh, based on a certain, you know, certain frame, certain, certain algorithm. Or the concept of immunobiopolitics, which basically means that societies are developing kind of, you know, uh, or trying to invest in developing some kind of immunity. And immunity in this context is, quite, of course, is not only a medical uh, concept, but it's also social, uh, deeply social, like, you know, immunity against uh, dangers, against threats, against those who might, uh, you know, uh, uh, be uh, considered as a potential source of danger. By the way, in uh, science fiction movies, this, uh, uh, this topic was developed much earlier, like decades ago. Uh, with the key question, what to do with people who might be, you know, a threat uh, to your community, uh, to the well-being of your community. Uh, another uh, uh, important concept here is the concept of resilience, that is basically was developed by the uh, by the European Union as a kind of substitution to uh, security, to, to have a reliance on security. And the resilience is another biopolitical concept that I, I expect it to grow in importance. Uh, especially against the background of COVID, uh, because resilience is uh, not about kind of total protection against all risks. No, it's about developing uh, uh, self-secured subjects, subjects who might be able to take care about themselves, uh, like school, for example, uh, employers, and uh, different uh, volunteer organizations, etc. So that's what matters in terms of resilience. So it's not only the sovereign power that would be uh, that, that you might expect to take care of yourself. No, it's the society itself that should be organized in such a way that uh, this idea of uh, self-secured and resilient subjects would become uh, a reality. Against resilience is an interesting concept. It was born as a purely academic, uh, you know, kind of uh, a reflection on 
on uh, the, the new states of uh, you know, risk society and uh, new endless number of uh, different, uh, uh, different threats and uh, menaces to, to security. And then it developed into, into a practical tool. So I would keep an eye on that. Uh, now repercussions for democracy. Does it all, all this you know, biopoliticization and uh, the clear uh, focusing on uh, protection of uh, human bodies and human lives, does it uh, contain, does it mean some kind of you know, repercussions or, or for, or for democracy? Is democracy in danger? Well, it depends, I would say. Of course, we have countries like Hungary, for example, in Europe, uh, whose government, uh, government, uh, government uh, just uh, took advantage of the COVID crisis for uh, further consolidating power in the hands of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the government. And we have countries like Poland that postponed presidential election uh, because of the COVID with some you know, suspicion that it also might be used <clears throat> by, the uh, by the government for manipulating public opinion, et cetera, et cetera. But I would differentiate between procedural things and uh, uh, more kind of uh, related to the content. From the perspective of procedure, I don't think that democracy is in danger. Hungary is still an exception. In all other countries of Europe, uh, while well, procedural democracy still works, even under the state of exception. I'll give you just an example of Finland, a country that uh, uh, we have uh, studied with a colleague of mine uh, in terms of how the country went through this, you know, two months of uh, state of exception. And in principle, we came to conclusion that uh, st the state of exception did not destroy democratic legitimacy. It was, you know, conducive to kind of more, uh, more consensual uh, state of minds in the society. But if you take a different, uh, uh, different direction, and, and, and if you ask whether liberalism is in danger, whether a liberal uh, part of democracy might be compromised because of, uh, because of the COVID, well, in that case, I would say that liberalism is, uh, uh, might be, uh, I mean, the perspective of liberalism might be a little bit less uh, certain. Uh, and in, in countries like Estonia, uh, for example, a country in which I live, uh, the current debates on the COVID are quite, uh, I would say, um, quite, quite strong uh, in the sense that people are discussing uh, quality of anti-crisis management that uh, for many is uh, below the expectations. And another issue which does not have, uh, you know, some perspectives of uh, opening, uh, you know, uh, new venues for liberalism is uh, how to treat foreigners in, uh, in Estonia. <clears throat> and uh, the point here is uh, that uh, for, let's say, right-wing populist indeed, uh, the COVID crisis is one of the best chances that they use for limiting uh, the inflow of foreigners, for imposing new regulations on foreign labor, including seasonal labor in Ukraine, for foreign students, etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, there is nothing new in that, but my point is that the COVID uh, emergency kind of exacerbated this, you know, illiberal momentum, uh, which is basically authored by specific parties. So we should not, of course, extend it to the whole society or to the whole government. But uh, some of the uh, basic liberal ideas are, of course, uh, let's say under under attack in uh, uh, many countries. And now they are, that's exactly the bridge to uh, illiberal countries like Russia, for example. And uh, the case of Russia is, uh, in my view, uh, increasingly uh, interesting. Uh, uh, being a kind of a liberal type of regime, Russia demonstrates a new dynamics in the last uh, uh, three, four months. And uh, since uh, I presume that not uh, all of the audience are uh, familiar with the, uh, with the most recent developments in Russia, I will spend a couple of minutes to explain. Uh, how the COVID-19 intervened into the uh, political process in Russia, which is of course uh, largely controlled and mastermind by, uh, by the Kremlin and uh, Putin personally. So uh, the country started a new political year in January with a quite unexpected uh, declaration from the president itself that we need to amend the constitution we need to change uh, some you know, important parts of the constitution, the 1993 constitution. And it started with discussing, uh, let's say, uh, multiple uh, uh, proposals, what need to be changed. And it, uh, it, it's not that important for our conversation. What is important 
is that this debate on constitutional amendment, in fact, ended up with, uh, uh, in fact, giving a green light to Putin's de facto long, uh, lifelong rule. Uh, so the new amendments or, or the new constitution would allow him legally to run for a re-election for another two consecutive presidential terms starting from 2024. So it basically means a, a, lifelong, a lifelong presidency for, for Putin. And that was the initial part of the, the initial design, and that was Putin's project for 2020. <clears throat> uh, he himself announced the idea. The idea very quickly passed through uh, the national parliament, the state Duma, in, I think, three readings. And then it was very fast signed into law by Putin in March 1990. So the deal is over. Technically speaking, uh, uh, from the viewpoint of uh, uh, legal governance, the deal is over. The constitutional amendments are already uh, enacted. They're already part of the Russian legislation. But Putin, from the very beginning, wanted some kind of public legitimation. And this brings me back to the way how uh, illiberal uh, authorities, illiberal regimes legitimize their policies and how the COVID uh, crisis might intervene into their uh, original plans. So uh, Putin was desperately uh, looking for some kind of, you know, public legitimation of his lifelong presidency. And that's what uh, uh, led him to this, uh, I would say, very awkward idea, uh, something between uh, referendum and plebiscite, something which I would call extra legal. It's not illegal, but it's extra legal. Even the head of Central Electoral Committee uh, confessed that we don't have the name for this procedure in Russian legislation. It's just, you know, kind of, you know, consultation with people, it's just asking people, it, it's a part of direct democracy. And that's what Putin was looking for. And direct democracy, as we know from theory, is one of the elements of populism. So if we try to dissect populism into uh, the most important elements, you'll definitely see this idea of direct democracy, kind of bypassing all these formalities, all these institutions. And I, my interpretation of uh, uh, this Putin's uh, a wish to, uh, to have this uh, plebiscite is, is exactly that uh, he's, uh, he, he's deeply populist leader and he was looking for this type, uh, this type of, um, uh, of approval. And uh, another, uh, another explanation which, is, uh, which continues the first one is that, uh, that this deeply populist nature of Putin's regime always requires investments in something which is performative, which is something that has uh, some meanings only if we look at it from performative perspective, not from the perspective of laws or legal action, but from the perspective of political symbolism, uh, from the perspective of uh, this highly, you know, secularized and mythologized uh, sphere of uh, uh, political leadership in Russia. And that's exactly what explains uh, these two performances of sovereignty, that Putin was ready uh, from the beginning of the year to, to stage. Uh, one was uh, the military parade uh, devoted to the victory a day in the Great Patriotic War, which is uh, the Russian version of the Second World War, which is a hugely important event uh, in Russia, not only because this is about memory politics, but it's also about uh, you know, clear reference to the Soviet uh, uh, military glory. It's a clear reference to uh, the Soviet Union as a great power with its own sphere of influence, with uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin sitting together and deciding deciding on the you know uh, the, the future of, of, of Europe, etc. Uh, so the May 9, uh, the the 9th of May parade was uh, very important, and it was postponed. Uh, and in, initially it was postponed indefinitely, and then it was rescheduled for you know last uh, uh, last uh, Sunday, I guess. Uh, and the second performative event was these people voting on kind of legitimizing Putin's uh, lifelong, uh, lifelong uh, role. Uh, and uh, in both cases, we see that Putin's regime uh, was very much uh, interested, very much eager to reach beyond purely technicalities of governance. Now, governance for Putin is a highly symbolic, again, I'm just repeating this, um, uh, uh, this, uh, this argument. And that's what uh, should be taken into account in all discussions on what sovereignty means for, uh, for Putin. It's something quasi-religious. 
you know, it's it's a deeply, a deeply, a deeply populist construct. Again, that needs uh, this uh, investments, uh, symbolic investment that imitate. Uh, Putin's uh, direct uh, contact with the people, and my point here is that both performances are extremely vulnerable because of uh, because of, of of COVID. Because conducting a military parade in the middle of the crisis, with uh, many people are still you know either dying on the critical conditions, is a problematic per se. And Putin was very much criticized by many in Russia for giving priority to this political symbolism over, you know, technicalities of uh, overcoming uh, the crisis and uh, exiting from, from the crisis. Uh, and of course, uh, organizing people's voting uh, a, a week later on the 1st of, of July, again, uh, when uh, the medical conditions are not that good and Russia is one of the, uh, the countries with a, with, a, with a major number of infected people, and with the future being very uncertain. Uh, well, I think this was also a very, I would say, problematic and uh, cumbersome and potentially consequential for Putin himself, uh, himself political, uh, political move. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, discourse so apart, so how, uh, how the Kremlin uh, was uh, uh, kind of legitimizing their, 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 their policies. It's, it's quite clear that uh, on the 1st of July, in just a few days from now, people in Russia would vote not for the constitutional amendments, but that would be a confidence or non-confidence vote to Putin's way of tackling the crisis, because that's what, what, what matters, in fact. Even if it's uh, formal, it's about constitution, but people would decide on uh, the abilities or uh, lack of abilities of the regime to govern, not to stage this, you know, huge performances. And what I have noticed in uh, the Russian discourse on COVID uh, in, that developed from, uh, you know, from scratch in February, March, and uh, it's still in the making, is that it's very dispersed. So there is not one single narrative. What is COVID? How shall we, you know, deal with it? No. Russian discourse is very dispersed. It's very fragmented. It always oscillates or vacillates between the extremes. And I'll just give you some examples taken from the Kremlin-controlled media that sent, it, uh, that, that sent too many controversial messages, I would say, to population. So one speaker would say that, oh, we should just, you know, completely disregard or neglect uh, the COVID. It's just an ordinary flu. It's not dangerous, uh, etc. So we, we, we shouldn't be bothered with that. On the other hand, we have a hyper-securitization of uh, you know the the development of the of, of the epidemic especially in large cities like moscow in which people could go to detention centers and even to jail they can be fined and arrested for non-compliance uh with regulation so it's it's either or either it's uh, completely uh, harmless or uh people would uh, you know uh, go to jail uh then uh, the official discourse also could not find, I think, failed to find a middle ground between saying that we are fighting for each and every life. Each and every life is important. That would be political, of course, quite, you know, expedient on the one hand. And on the other hand, saying something that many, uh, many medical doctors would say. And this is, I mean, those who die, they are supposed to die. Uh, there is very little we can do with that. And I would call it kind of semi-fascist statement, because if you say that those who died are just supposed to die, so there is nothing... Nothing unusual in that. Well, I do see this statement quite problematic in terms of political legitimacy and in terms of our understanding of humanity as well. So that's also a kind of you know a gap between this uh, this position. Uh, then uh, uh, I, I I I presume that the discourse was kind of ruptured between uh, very strict measures of uh, uh, digital and video surveillance uh, in many, especially big cities like uh, Moscow, Nizhny Novgorod, Kazan, etc. on the one hand, and on the other hand, voices who would say, well, in fact, what we need to do is just sit back and relax, and the more people catch the virus, the better it's going to be, because the society would develop an immunity to that. That's the only way to develop immunity is to have all of us infected. And that was also translated through, you know, official media, again, uh, even widening or broadening this gap between completely different interpretations. So do we need to surveil people? Do we need to isolate people? Or we need just to, uh, yeah, to kind of uh, uh, 
uh, calmly and uh, you know patiently wait for you know for this collective immunity. Uh, then, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, many uh, high-level Russian speakers would say that uh, vaccines are not helpful and uh, we are not sure that they might be effective. And on the other hand, the same people would say, no, but Russia needs to invest in uh, new vaccines because that's uh, how new competition in, in the pharmaceutical industry will be, would look like. So we need to be first. Again, that's very controversial. If you don't believe in efficiency, why do you need to invest in this, uh, in this sphere? Uh, Russia went through a very long debate on whether uh, the COVID causes death or it's just, just a, uh, something that exacerbates the pre-existing symptoms. And that was one of the, one of the arguments of the Kremlin that de facto numbers of deaths in Russia are low because all the deaths are not from COVID. They are from div uh, completely different, uh, uh, different medical conditions. And that was used as a, as a political argument. Again, a very interesting uh, kind of connection between medical, uh, uh, medical debate and political debate. So it was used as, as a part of you know, legitimizing the effectiveness of Russian, uh, Russian policy. And what I uh, noticed that that's quite, you know, um, um, quite interesting that allegedly uh, all the post-Soviet countries have their own specificity. Uh, all post-Soviet countries are much better prepared to the, to the virus, much better than, the, than New York, than Lombardia and other places uh, because of the Soviet legacy. Again, this is a kind of conversion of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, public health uh, argument into political argument saying that, oh, we in the post-Soviet space are, uh, are different from others. Uh, if we look at the institutional, uh, institutional setting in Russia, the most striking uh, effect of, of the COVID crisis is what I would call Putin institutional dysentery. And those of you who are familiar with political philosophy, especially with such big names as Carl Schmitt, for example, uh, I think you can confirm the fact that uh, uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in political theory, uh, we do have a presumption that a state of exception is supposed to concentrate power, is supposed to uh, consolidate power, is supposed to be used by, uh, uh, by the authorities as an additional instrument for uh, having an upper hand on, you know, uh, on sovereignty and the right to control, etc. Well, Russia demonstrates a little bit different dynamics, which is puzzling per se, because uh, what uh, was consensually, uh, uh, how shall I say, noticed and uh, commented by most of the uh, uh, most of the commentators is that Putin kind of voluntarily uh, divested himself from the playing the central position, central role in the political system. Uh, while in fact, all major crisis management powers in Russia have been relegated from the Kremlin as allegedly a center of Russian sovereignty to, to the government, the new government of Mikhail Mishustin that, was, uh, uh, that came to power uh, as, a part, as a part of this constitutional uh, reshuffling. And that's a completely new, a new political figure in the Russian political scene. Uh, so for example, uh, proclaiming the state of, uh, the state of, accept, uh, the, the state of uh, emergency is not the prerogative of Putin. It's, uh, it falls into the competence of, uh, of government. Uh, then uh, the powers have been re redistributed to the crisis management board, led not by Putin, surprise, surprise, but uh, by Sergei Sabanin, the mayor of Moscow. Uh, and the mayor of Moscow in Russian power hierarchy is always a very powerful figure. And then a very significant amount of powers uh, have been distributed to regional governors. Russia is uh, the formerly federation, well, I would say very centralized federation and federation on paper. But the governors, the local elites have been struggling for uh, having their say in political, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the political management and political debate for decades. And Putin was consistently depriving them of uh, uh, any ability to influence uh, decision-making process. Now, in a clear reversal of this logic, Putin said, now you have all the powers uh, when it comes to many significant parts of uh, everyday lives in the regions. 
Like for example, governors uh, have their uh, their final say on discontinuing uh, some industrial, uh, you know, enterprises or uh, taking decisions concerning uh, the labor market conditions and many other uh, new spheres uh, are falling into the competence of regional governors. And again, this is a reversal of the previous logic of hyper mega centralized state. So what we see is a kind of redistribution of power among um, uh, uh, several levels. How to explain this puzzle? How to explain this riddle? Well, one of my very general explanation is, again, a conceptual distinction between sovereignty and the governance or governmentality, if you use this uh, concept developed by Michel Foucault. So sovereignty is something that is, stands beyond all those, you know, uh, uh, technical and administrative and managerial things. So Putin wants to be uh, a president who uh, is associated with good news, uh, with something positive, and all other, let's say, dirty work is supposed to be done by, uh, by the government, by uh, the Moscow mayor and his team, and by regional uh, regional direction. So that's exactly the uh, the way how Putin uh, sees this uh, you know distinction between the holder of sovereignty, a quasi-religious figure, a lifelong uh, ruler uh, beyond any you know limitations and restrictions, and just ordinary people, people uh, people on the ground. I think this is exactly what might be a problem uh, for for Putin, especially in the expectation of. Uh, uh, of the July the 1st uh, uh, election. And now I have just a few slides, uh, very, very fast, maybe another three, four minutes. Repercussions for domestic politics and for foreign policy. Well, when it comes uh, to domestic perspective, well, I would say Putin is playing a very risky game uh, in, uh, you know, kind of uh, conducting uh, or hosting a referendum in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, which uh, uh, is uh, perceived by many as uh, uh, something that uh, the Kremlin should have avoided, uh, at least before uh, the situation stabilizes. Uh, so it's risky game it, it itself. Uh, then I think uh, this, uh, uh, this situation with, uh, with a military parade in the middle of the pandemic and the people's voting, the fact of plebiscite, uh, shows us a growing gap, a growing cleavage between the two logic of logics of power and two spheres of power, which I have mentioned already. On the one hand, it's a sacralized national identity with military parade and military glory and this all, all this, you know, uh, symbolic bubble, I would call it this way, on the one hand, and technology of everyday governance and technology of crisis management. These are two different spheres and uh, I, I don't see... Uh, kind of a middle ground between them. So I would expect a growing disparity between these two logics. Then uh, what we see is that Kremlin uh, has a very simple uh, self-legitimation strategy, basically claiming that we are, we in Russia are doing much better than in the West, or either because we have a Soviet uh, legacy, Soviet heritage of public medicine, or just because we are better by definition, etc. all this kind of, you know, cheap rhetoric. On the other hand of the political spectrum, we have dispersed opposition groups that don't have one single position regarding the, uh, the, the, the voting uh, on the 1st of July. Some of them would call for boycotting uh, the referendum, the so-called referendum. Some of them would say, no, 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 you should uh, cast your vote and you should vote no uh, to that. We'll see how it works. Uh, what is also uh, uh, discussed uh, quite intensely in the Russian media is that this de facto emergency referendum creates new opportunities and new spaces for falsification of votes and vote re uh, rigging. Uh, well, for example, in two major cities in Moscow, in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, there are two different parallel tracks. So you can either vote online or you, or you can vote traditionally. And there is already a scandal with the journalist who tried to vote online and then he voted uh, physically. So he voted twice. And the Ministry of Interior already reacted to, uh, to that. So, I mean, uh, it's already kind of discussed what this, what this spectacle is, uh, is about. Uh, what is unusual, it's extending timing. So instead of one day, it's the whole week that uh, people can vote. So it, it, it is already started. 
um, uh, so it's kind of you know extended time for for voting and so extended time for manipulation of course and the most important thing is i, I didn't mention that uh, maybe i should have done that before it's a steady fall of putin's approval ratings uh against the background of COVID, and that might be the most deadly uh, repercussion of, of of the whole situation uh putin is losing in popularity Putin is, is more and more uh, perceived as uh, not just an aging leader. He's, well, relatively young in comparison to, I know, Silva Berlusconi and other pe uh, people. Uh, but he's kind of politically tired, and that's what people notice. And he's losing his leadership charisma instead of kind of using the COVID for national consolidation, for, you know, underlining his uh, leadership qualities while the dynamics is uh, is the opposite. Uh, now, foreign policy repercussions. Another couple of minutes, and I'll finish here. Well, what was uh, very visible uh, is that Russia trying to activate its uh, foreign policy because of the crisis, with the most interesting case of Russian humanitarian convoy to Italy. Uh, 14 military jets uh, landed in Italy, NATO member state, by the way, and these were Russian military jets uh, uh, that uh, kind of officially speaking, they were helping Italy to uh, fight uh, uh, the crisis in the most affected uh, parts of the, of the country. The same, uh, same also took place in uh, Serbia. Uh, well, I would say that this was mostly again a performative showcase uh, of Russian goodwill of Russia as a kind of, you know, benevolent country, caring country, country that might be helpful. Uh, it's not the country that uh, annexed Crimea or started a war in Donbass. It's kind of, basically, I would, uh, I would qualify this as a kind of rebranding of Russia from, uh, let's say, uh, a military threat to a kind of uh, good neighbor and, uh, again, country that might share and and, and help uh etc it was a very short-lived uh, episode but i think uh, it, it, it 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 this is something that russia might repeat in the future this kind of in you know, a health diplomacy uh, again much will depend on whether russia would be able to sell its uh, uh you know story of uh, fighting uh, COVID crisis as a success story or not it's still open <clears throat> then uh uh, another important point, uh, Putin came up at the very beginning of the crisis with the proposals to lift sanctions. I think he made this statement at the virtual uh, G, uh, G20 summit, saying that, oh, now we have a global state of emergency, uh, no time for sanctions, uh, and let's just, you know, do something with it. It did not, uh, uh, was not taken seriously by, by any, uh, any of other international actors. And the European Union even prolonged sanctions against Russia. So in, in, in this sense, nothing has changed for Russia uh, with these humanitarian actions and these attempts to rebrand Russia as, uh, as a responsible part of the international community. Moreover, the crisis brought up new evidences of, uh, uh, let's say, troubles with the Eurasian integration, which is one of the core elements of Putin's foreign policy. Uh, what uh, we can see quite clearly is a new round of uh, kind of, you know, tug of war between Mons Moscow and Minsk. Putin, Lukashenko, and Lukashenko was extremely unhappy uh, because Russia closed borders with Belarus. And he said that uh, it's not the way how uh, friends and allies uh, behave in times of uh, trouble. Then Lukashenko was the only one who hosted the military parade on the 9th of May. In fact, challenging Putin in this symbolic, uh, in this sphere of symbolic policy, saying, we in Belarus, we are not afraid as others. Well, he did not pee finger to those others, but it was quite clear that that was against, you know, a gesture against Putin. So we do have this kind of, you know, a symbolic competition and uh, a war of uh, words against the two capitals, which is not good for, you know, for... Uh, good neighborly relations, at, and it's even uh, worse for Eurasian integration. And another evidence is uh, the virtual summit of uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, in which the president of Kazakhstan, a major country, uh, refused to include healthcare issues into the common package. Well, in the middle of the crisis, healthcare, medicine, of course, if you're serious about integration, you should expect 
that that might be dealt somehow, you know, in a more or less coordinating way. No, President of Kazakhstan said healthcare is national, so we don't we, we don't trust uh, Eurasian integration uh, bodies in that. Then another important development that might be interesting for Indonesian audience is that uh, most of Russian uh, think tankers uh, quite clearly uh, uh, quite clearly uh, presumed that we are witnessing uh, a new bipolarity and that's going to be US US China bipolarity in the global arena uh, which uh, I mean in my interpretation it's a very serious reconsideration of uh, the initial Rus uh, Russian expectations of multipolarity in which Russia would be able to play an equal role to other countries now I think it's a time uh, for a more sober assessment of the future and in fact, many, uh, many foreign policy experts in Russia would uh, quite, you know, frankly and sincerely admit that in this new post-COVID bipolarity, US-China bipolarity, Russia won't be able to play, uh, you know, uh, equal role and Russia won't be able to be uh, a kind of, you know, premier league uh, player uh, to borrow from um, uh, sports uh, lexicon. And of course, there were some attempts uh, to find a new language and a new kind of common background with the European Union from the part of Russia, a new rhetoric of, uh, uh, you know, common Europe, uh, which basically reflects this understanding that uh, uh, partnership with China is very limited for Russia, that it's very unlikely that China would be, you know, happy to consider Russia as an equal partner. And uh, that might be a game changer potentially, but I'm sure that might take uh, years. And uh, that's exactly what uh, might constitute Russian post-COVID foreign policy agenda. Thank you very much. I'm stopping here and uh, looking forward for, for discussion. Thank you, Andre. Uh, a very extensive overview of the, of the situation in Russia and how uh, <clears throat> How Russia is actually responds uh, to respond to the to the crisis, and to which I found a very I don't know, a lot of similarities um, with what happened in Indonesia or in other countries, uh, especially regarding this uh, denial of uh, uh, of the actual crisis. So, if I remember correctly, in Indonesia, in 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 the early stages of of the of the COVID crisis. Even the the minister for health uh, jokingly saying that saying that uh, this is just an ordinary flu again with similar similar rhetoric with with what you have mentioned and also there is this idea that the government uh, the Indonesian government at least is trying to and somehow uh, raising other issues so we we do have. Uh, a new uh, law on, on, on many other things uh, that were uh, controversially discussed before. So many elements in the society actually rejected that uh, proposal. Uh, but then suddenly during this pandemic, uh, the, the parliament passes the law and, and, and then people were, are shocked that it's actually passed. So, I mean, I think we can find uh, several similarities uh, again with the other countries as well, with the US, uh with with Poland I think we we absolutely yeah so I think we can start our discussion session now mm -hmm. um, would like us would like to ask uh, the participant to turn on their video so we can actually see each other during the discussion uh so it's not like uh, only me and Andre <laughs> talking with All right with the two of us so other participant, could you please also turn the video and we can actually start discussion. Uh, we do have a comment before, uh, we have a one question, uh, one raise hand and one comments. Uh, I think I will move to the comments first from Piotr Binder. Binder? Uh, there is this uh, one comment about uh, the situation in Poland and about Andres, uh Point about the European example of how COVID-19 actually influenced the democracy. If, if Andre can actually see the, the, the... I'm trying to. Is it on participants? No. Yeah, so it's in the chat. Uh... Maybe Piotr could uh, 
tell us uh, what you mean by that. If if you are there. Oh yes, I am. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Um, it, it's it's in the chat. It was actually oh, the, the other way right. around as it was presented, because the government was pushing for the elections, because it was a very favorable situation for them. Mm -hmm. to, to hold them in, in May. And actually, the entire opposition, all the experts, scholars, political scientists, all of them were against that idea very much. And they dropped that. They dropped that idea. Um, at some point, they had this, 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 um, this idea of organizing disposal elections. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, there was a consensus that, the, um, that it would be a, a dangerous experiment, that we are not ready for this. And the idea was dropped. And the elections will take place this Sunday. Right. That's what I know. Yeah. So that, that was actually our remark. So... No, I, th I think it is uh, it, it it is important. I mean, uh, when we look at different national um, national experiences and national examples of uh, what kind of changes uh, the COVID crisis uh, triggered, uh, I think this idea of postponing something and then reschedule, I think it's also uh, it's also part of this uh, of this uh, experience. Yeah. I think it's only after election in, in, in Poland that we can make some, you know, some conclusions about the whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have also one uh, question from one of my colleagues from Erlanga, but we have Vincencio to give mm -hmm. you. Yes, yes, okay. Um, uh, and could you turn your sorry. videos as well? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, we can, we okay. can see it. Uh, uh, Professor Makarichev, thank you very much uh, for the you know enlightening uh, thoughts. Uh, I am very new on this particular uh, topic actually, uh, but uh, then it really drives me to uh, at least raise two questions. Okay. Uh, one, something to do with uh, uh, you were saying about the domestic repercussions of what is going on um, in Russia. Uh, I was. I was listening to what you said then, and I, I was remembering what was happening with President Suharto when he came to power in the uh, late 1960s. So, uh, except for the um, sort of uh, the issue between COVID-19, probably for uh, President Putin at the moment, but uh, for President uh, Suharto at the time was a threat of communism. So, consolidation and all the things that uh, uh, were made by were, were taken by uh, President uh, President Putin at the moment. Really, really reminds me to what is happening with uh, President Suharto at that particular time. And uh, go through for 32 years uh, when he was when he was uh, when he was power, uh, when he was in power. So of course the difference uh, only when I'm listening to what you said. Uh, uh, the context of I would say I mean a lot of the. Uh, Western powers at the time was behind uh, President Suarez. Uh, whatever he was he was doing, was you know was accepted or was support, uh, was supported by the Western Western government. But my point is this: um, by the time President Suarez was doing all those things, at the same time actually it triggers, uh, I would call it the uh, underground opposition uh, at the domestic domestic level. Right, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, at the end of the day, uh, it really breeds the, uh, I would call it the uh, political activists uh, who were then uh, become very prominent uh, where they were trying to top down, uh, toppling down President Sarto in the late uh, 1990s. So my question is this, uh, do you see any, you know, sort of, I don't know how, how is the, 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 the exact term for, um, the case of uh, Russia at the moment. Do you see, do you, do you see any sort of opposition uh, at the moment that uh, against the you know, the whole movements uh, made by President Putin, be it at the uh, political how do how do we go, political organizations or be also in the form of for example for example individual activists or 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 or, or, or others. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that's my first question. Uh, my second question, uh, Raditya, can I go, go on with my second question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, yes, yeah. yes, yes. My, my second question, uh, just to follow on from Prof. Uh, Makarichev's uh, point regarding Russia's stance at the, uh, let's say, uh, global level. Uh, many people were, uh, at the moment, I think, scientists, uh, experts, IR uh, scholars, thinking about what, well, let's say, other major powers outside, as you said, US and China at the moment, that could uh, at least uh, sort of um, raise up as the third party. Because at the moment, I think some people are thinking about EU as a whole, uh, which probably in the future can probably uh, play some sort of roles in determining uh, the future of a global order. But at the same time, people are also thinking about, about Russia as could be one of the candidates. So what do you think? Would you think that Russia would be likely one of the, let's say, you know, other parties outside of the two that could determine the future of uh, global order? Thank you. Uh, well, on, on your first question, uh, I, I do see, exa exactly as you said, I do see some parallels with other uh, countries, including your own and parallels with Suharto can be also, you know, uh, mentioned in this, in this context. Uh, well, in the case of Russia, this, uh, let's say, uh, authoritarian or illiberal uh, devolution, I think uh, it's more consequential for... Uh, uh, for Russia's neighbors and for the international community, because Russia is a permanent member of uh, UN Security Council, Russia is a nuclear power, etc. So, if you have this, uh, you know, these developments uh, uh, away from, uh, let's say, basic uh, democratic principles towards uh, uh, consolidation of power, uh, using many, many, you know, different uh, tricks uh, in one hand. Well, I think this deserves uh, quite, you know, a serious discussion and uh, attention uh, in the world. And on opposition, well, this is, uh, uh, well, there is a debate on, on, on that. What, uh, what is more or less clear that uh, opposition uh, does exist, but it's very dispersed uh, and it's not well organized. If you uh, uh, just talk to many ordinary Russians, most likely, uh, not many of them would, uh, how shall I say, publicly express uh, their admiration for Putin. So they might be relatively critical or, you know, uh, neutral, but not necessarily kind of, you know, uh, praising Putin, uh, etc. But this opposition, uh, it, it's more like, you know, a societal than political. It exists in the society, but it's not, uh, it, 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 it's not well organized. Why? Well, because of three factors. First of all, uh, the most uh, uh, consistent uh, opposition leaders, they are abroad. They don't live in Russia. They left Russia. And that's what uh, Putin's regime, in fact, uh, is very happy with. So these people, they do exist. They can say whatever they want about Putin. But for domestic audience, it's very easy to portray them as outsiders. Oh, they are, they are living in, I know, in Europe, in the United States. So they are not formally connected to what's going on in Russia. So they do exist and they are, again, quite consistent, but they are not part of Russian domestic, uh, how should I say, dynamic. Then some of the quite consistent opposition have been repressed. And they are either in jail or they are facing uh, facing trials, uh, including uh, one of the best uh, 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 figures in Russian theatrical world, uh, Kirill Serebrnikov, who is facing. Uh, he's a very, I would say, self-minded and uh, very free-thinking, you know, a creative, uh, a creative person, an artist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these people are, you know, under repressions, and that's what we also need to to consider. And the third factor is that many of the opposition figures have been integrated into the regime, so they've been kind of, you know, proposed a deal. 
uh, uh, so you keep your views with you, I mean, but you don't go too, you know, too public and too far with that. So it's kind of uh, systemic opposition. That's what I would call systemic opposition. It's, it, it, they, they, they are formally not a part of the ruling party, United Russia, but they are part of the system in, in a general sense. They can afford a limited pluralism and a limited, uh, let's say, uh, opposing views just for creating the image of a normal, uh, uh, normal country. So in this sense, yes, that's, uh, th these are three factors that I think drastically diminish the, uh, the public role of the opposition. And when it comes to the July the 1st, uh, whatever, plebiscite or referendum, well, there is no single position about that. Some, some of the opposition leaders would say you need to boycott, you just need to ignore it because this is all staged, this is just a performance. And others would say, no, no, you should go and you should vote negative. So there is no one single strategy in this, uh, um, in this regard. And it's very hard to, uh, to predict what, what's going to happen. What I noticed is that some parts of this systemic opposition, I mean, loyal opposition, they are becoming more and more radical, like a, a communist party that was always kind of uh, being part of, uh, of, of the parliament and uh, uh, they supported, I mean, many of policies of the Kremlin. But in the meantime, they tried to keep a kind of certain distance with the Kremlin. So this is what the, the game was about. On the one hand, you are loyal, but on the other hand, you keep your autonomy and how to, you know, how to play with these two. And what I noticed that Communist Party became much more radical. Uh, because they are completely unhappy with this lifelong presidency. And they say, but that's exactly what uh, destroyed the Soviet Union. So how can you be critical towards uh, the Communist Party? How can you be, you be critical about Brezhnev and Andropov and uh, uh, Chernenko? I mean, all those general secretaries that have been dying in office. And now you give a green light to Putin, who most likely, I mean, if he runs for another two presidential terms, he will be another Brezhnev in his late 80s, uh, et etc. et cetera, et cetera. So the Communist Party, in my view, becomes a little bit more kind of, you know, active in uh, challenging the whole idea of, uh, of referendum. But let, let, let's see, uh, much will depend on how much Putin will get. Most likely he will get majority, but it's uh, turned out that is important. Uh, and it's important, I mean, uh, how much above 50% he will get. If it's 55 percent, 55 against 45, that's a split. If it's uh, 90 against 10, well, that's suspicious. So let's see uh, how it how it plays out ultimately on Russia and the, and, and the global order. Well, frankly speaking, I don't see any resources for Russia to be a shaper of a new world. And uh, there is one more uh, element in my analysis, which I did mention. This is uh, 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 oil prices, global oil prices that are just, you know, dropping to the level that preceded the fall of the Soviet Union. So we need to take it seriously. I mean, the fall of the Soviet Union was directly connected with, uh, with, with the uh, fall of uh, uh, energy prices. And that's what deprived the Soviet budget of, uh, of, of, of uh, net uh, sources of revenues. Now, what is developing in, in, the, in the global oil uh, and gas markets is, is, is very similar to that. So I just don't see how Putin might have sufficient resources for you know, mobilizing them for you know, this role of global shaper. Uh, Russia is under sanctions. And again, this is also what affects, what hits Russian economy. That's for sure. I mean, sanctions is something that uh, has a kind of, you know, long cycle of, uh, you know, functioning. Uh, and Russia is quite, I mean, Russian economy is quite resilient. So we shouldn't expect immediate effects, but long-term effects will definitely be, uh, be quite significant. So sanctions, uh, uh, negative dynamics of uh, energy prices and, uh, a number of highly expensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, projects and events that just uh, were very serious blow to Russian budget before the COVID, like uh, you know, starting from Sochi Olympics and then the World FIFA Cup, all those you know performative events that did not give anything to economy 
plus, in fact, two wars simultaneously, Syria and Ukraine. So if you, if you take all this together, uh, you'll see that Russia was, achieve, was, was trying to achieve a lot in Syria, in Ukraine, trying to present Russia as a shaper, as an important player, while well, the result is sanctions and uh, very, I would say, uh, difficult relations with Saudi Arabia and other major producers of, uh, you know, major shapers of uh, oil prices. So I think uh, if you look at this from the point of view of balance of, uh, you know, advantages and disadvantages, well, I would say Russia has more problems than solutions in, in that. And even, even on the regional level, look at the Eurasian integration, which I have mentioned. I'm not talking about global, uh, global level of analysis, but even when it comes to Russian sphere of influence, there is a very clear gap between desires and practical policies. Desires are still there. And Russia still talks about integration, still talks about reassembling you know, this Soviet uh, heritage, Soviet legacy, et cetera, et cetera. In practice, they are in a state of uh, uh, tug of war with uh, the, the, the closest ally, which is uh, uh, Belarus and Minsk. Well, I watched just yesterday a video from this military parade in which Putin intentionally did not shake hand to the son of Lukashenko, just intentionally. He just ignored him. And that was, uh, that was video recorded. I mean, is it an evidence of good relations? No, it's an evidence of like, let's say the two, uh, the two guys that cannot stand each other. Uh, and then this, you know, the case of Kazakhstan that does not want to share, uh, you know, uh, powers and competences. Uh, by the way, the most successful uh, story in all post-Soviet uh, space when it comes to COVID is Georgia. The Georgia, small Georgia is known as a real success story. Well, it, at least uh, that's what I know. Of course, the country wanted to open up to uh, summer uh, tourist season and it, it did uh, a lot. Uh, but Georgia is, uh, is, is doing quite, quite okay. And Georgia is not part of any of this Eurasian, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it also tells a lot about Russian regional hegemony and Russian ability to play the role that Russia kind of designed for itself. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, we have uh, two more questions, I think. Uh, one from uh, my former student, but Johannes, could you turn on your video and ask Andrei? Hello, good afternoon, Andre. Hello. Good afternoon, Professor Andre. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for your uh, insightful explanation. I have two questions about Russia's domestic politics. Mm -hmm. uh, considering Putin to prolong his presidency term by amending the constitution and as well as rescheduling the people's vote. Uh, and also considering his decline of approval rating by uh, in, in relations with his anti-crisis strategy, what would Putin gain in a case scenario if the people's vote passed and the constitution is amended while his very own approval rating is declining? Mm -hmm. Isn't it going to not benefit him to prolong his presidency term or, or something? Why? And the second question is, why Putin didn't consolidate his power in times of emergency uh, in order to gain more uh, power and more approval rating and public opinion towards him? I think that's all my question. Well, the, on, the, on the first question, well, I would say uh, knowing uh, or being aware of uh, the way how Russian political system uh, functions, it's very unlikely that Putin will lose the referendum or the, 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 put, the, the people's uh, voting. Uh, I don't think that uh, the negative voting can, can numerically prevail. Uh, at least uh, all, all his apparatus will do its best to get the, you know, uh, the desired results. Uh, and they do have an experience of, uh, you know, 
uh, falsifying um, uh, votes, and they, they will definitely use this uh, this mechanism this time if, if needed. I, I I don't have any doubts uh, about that. Uh, well, the, the 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 problem is that um, it's not a negative vote itself, but the problem is that under the condition of declining uh, approval ratings and declining popularity of Putin as such, uh, the price for loyalty is going to be higher. So when the president is successful, when the president is the center of political universe, well, he's not supposed to, well, let's say, pay for loyalty. He's not supposed to buy loyalty. People would be happy to align with him. People would be happy to express publicly their whatever. Now, if you have a, let's say, not a lame duck, but a weakening president, a president who is highly criticized, even from, you know, from in the position of his internal circle, well, buying loyalty would be a little bit more expensive for him. And uh, frankly speaking, I don't, know whether he has enough uh, resources for uh, keeping this uh, huge system of bureaucracy uh, operational and uh, uh, workable. Because for many regional elites in Russia, like for example in Northern Caucasus, and Chechnya is the best example of that, well, the only reason to remain loyal to Putin is money. It's just because they, uh, I mean, the Moscow invests so much money in, uh, in, in the regional budgets that they, they buy loyalty in a, in a physical sense. Now, if you have, uh, let's say, much less money in the budget uh, and uh, much more problematic, uh, let's say, leadership style of Putin himself, well, I would expect that some regions would start thinking a little bit, you know, in a different way, more like, you know, autonomously. I'm not speaking about something like, you know, like a decentralization, etc. But it might, it, it might be just a trigger. It might be a start to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, less centralized Russia, Russia which would be more reliant on uh, you know, local, uh, local leaders and local municipal and uh, uh, regional authorities rather than uh, on uh, Moscow. And another, uh, I would say, uh, troublesome point is that in many regions, especially those surrounding Moscow, uh, I mean, neighboring to Moscow, anti-Moscow feelings, they are so strong that many regions de facto officially introduced a policy of banning Moscovites from coming to their regions. Can you imagine that? It's, it's one single country, but they would say, oh, Moscow, uh, Moscovites are not welcome here because Moscovites would, you know, uh, are contagious and uh, they would uh, spread the virus. No, 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 keep, you know, living in your, in, in, in your big city. So it, it's, it's also kind of, you know, societal trend that might be troublesome for, for the Kremlin. So I'm not speaking about something which might immediately work against Putin, but I'm speaking about a constellation of different factors that might just uh, re, uh, reshape uh, the whole, you know, domestic uh, scenery. On the, your second question, uh, why Putin uh, did, did not uh, do anything for uh, even more strongly centralizing power, well, again, my explanation is very simple. He does not want to have uh, to bear uh, on his shoulders any responsibility for potential uh, failures, potential mismanagement, etc. He delegates all this to uh, to uh, to the government, uh, to the regional authorities, and he himself uh, is a president of good news. That's his role. That's his role. He, he's just a president of good weather. And when it's bad weather, it's up to others to come up with bad news. And it's up to others to be responsible for potential policy failures, for potential disconnect. For example, imagine if people in some parts of huge Russia would start more publicly expressing their dissatisfaction with lockdowns, with loss of jobs. And people are, I mean, people are really suffering. Because uh, according to uh, economic forecasts, up to 20 millions of Russians might lose their jobs. I mean, this is not a joke. 20 millions. Uh, so in case of uh, you know, public uh, unrest and public, uh, let's say, dissatisfaction with that, 
Putin would be able to kind of uh, say a very simple thing. It's, it, it's up to your original bosses who took wrong decisions. It's not, I mean, nothing has to do with me or with the Kremlin. Of course, it's too, I would say, uh, too simple. But that's a simple game that he plays. He does not want to take responsibility. He, he always relegates responsibility for potentially troublesome issues to someone else. And now the question is, how can you sustain your leadership for a long time using this model? Always kind of, you know, uh, uh, trying to uh, jump out of, uh, you know, this central place or central role in the political system when it comes to serious issues. That's a big issue uh, to me. But let's see. Thank you, Andre, uh, uh, for the answer. We also have a question from... Thank you, Professor, for the answer. Yep, yeah, thank you, Anas. Uh, we also have a question uh, uh, from my good friend, uh, Diaz, but he couldn't ask it directly, so uh, he, he put it on the, our, our chat system about the governmentality process. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about the subject of... So, so is the subject of power remain conscious about the, uh, of the government strategy? I mean, in Indonesia, uh, people are actually protesting about how Indonesian government handled the situation. He's asking if the same situation happens in Russia. And can we say that in this uh, governmentality process, this subject of power possibly has a collective awareness? Right. Yes, people are protesting. That's a very interesting point, whether governmentality may be uh, or might become an object of uh, kind of dissatisfaction or, uh, pro uh, or some kind of protestation. Uh, well, first of all, during the log well, de facto lockdown protesting, I mean, publicly protesting is out of question because uh, the police is attentively monitoring all the public spaces. And in case if you even, uh, you know, deploy a poster uh, or uh, do something publicly uh, that might remind uh, or resemble some kind of, you know, uh, disagreement, uh, well, in just a matter of a uh, few minutes, you will be taken to the custody. And you will, uh, uh, yeah, you will not be able to, to, to public, publicly do anything. So that's why many of the forms of protest are kind of not that publicly visible. And that's why, uh, sociologically speaking, we don't know how strong is this dissatisfaction. Because in normal times, we would expect that people would go to streets. Uh, now, it, it is just legally forbidden. I think it's still forbidden. I mean, all these public gatherings, et cetera, et cetera. And Putin, Putin definitely takes advantage of that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we have a, a protest movement uh, that have been, uh, uh, how shall I say, that, that appeared uh, from, uh, from the medical community. Uh, there is an, uh, an organization named uh, Alliance of Medical Doctors, uh, which uh, tries to go public, well, public in the sense of online activity, etc., just telling real stories about how bad is the situation with Russian hospitals and kind of uh, trying to challenge all those, uh, you know, rosy pictures that Russia is doing well, that Russia is uh, better than other countries, that we are not that deadly affected. Well, in fact, this alliance of medical doctors, uh, their message is very simple. In Moscow, maybe, but Moscow is an exception. It's a cosmopolitan, very wealthy and affluent city. So in Moscow, a very, let, let's say, a powerful mayor. So in Moscow, you might go relatively well. But look at the province. Look at uh, other cities uh, uh, that are really struggling. They don't have equipment. They don't have medical professionals. They don't have funds for that. So they are protesting against this you know, false, uh, how shall I say, celebration of Russian uh, success in uh, fighting, uh, fighting the, the virus. But basically this protest is just about revealing and going public with the real picture. So that's how they see their, uh, their role. We are just filming, we are recording the real state of affairs. Is it a protest against uh, the state-led governmentality? Yes, I think it is. Uh, then uh, we also uh, have, of course, many online-based uh, uh, based groups uh, uh, extremely critical about uh, about that, and one of the object objects of criticism is that the states, uh, the state in Russia, the government is insufficiently uh, kind of uh, uh, 
uh, active uh, in uh, releasing uh, emergency funds to help people who lost their jobs. Uh, and they compare uh, the numbers and figures with uh, other countries in, uh, in Europe, uh, saying that, well, Russian governmentality is very cheap. So the state is not sharing these funds that we have been you know, accumulating for what? For a crisis. Now we do have a crisis. And what the state says, the state says, no, uh, this is not a real crisis. We still need this money for, I know, 2023, 2024. So we are not going to release uh, the funds to help ordinary people who might need some, you know, some additional money because, well, basically because they were staying home according to the governmental regulations and they were losing in their salaries. So this is a discussion about governmentality, whether the government does enough to help people to at least, you know, keep their living standards at, uh, uh, at minimal uh, level. Because imagine losing job in Russia is, uh, is, is, is not a good news as in, in all other countries as well. So in this sense, this is also kind of, you know, a protest uh, against, uh, uh, against financial policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the opposition leaders, Alexei Navalny, who is basically kind of a, a YouTube personality, but he always raises this issue. Russia claims to be a wealthy state. Russia accumulated so much money. Russia has so many oligarchs. And uh, these oligarchs are investing so much money in the foreign uh, property and foreign funds. Maybe it's time already to start sharing. I think it is discussion about governmentality. It's, it's not discussion about this, you know, uh, completely abstract, uh, you know, uh, ideas of national identity, civilizational identity, memory policy, Soviet legacy. No, that's, uh, that's more about ideology. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in, in, in this sense, uh, this governmentality is not taken uh, as, uh, you know, something that people just need to mechanically obey and accept. But I, again, we are just at the very beginning mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of that. And who knows uh, how this would, uh, would evolve? Who knows what kind of results this state of mind in the society might, you know, give uh, uh, the, the 1st of July uh, referendum? Uh, okay, Andre, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but we do have one, uh, I think, two questions, but I, could, I, I, I will try to make it into one mm -hmm. big question about Russia's, uh, again, the position in global uh, arena, or maybe in regional uh, uh, level, uh, about the relations with the EU and uh, Russia's image after, after, after this crisis. Uh, could you comment on whether Russia's image, uh, at least in the uh, in the uh, between the European countries or within the EU, would uh, would they benefit from from this crisis? I mean, uh, you mentioned that Russia uh, gives some like this kind of helps to to the to Italy to other countries as well, and whether that will actually help Russia's image within the EU. And also, if you could comment on, uh, as, as your last point, maybe you could comment on what will happen in the next, in this uh, uh, referendum, in the 1st of July referendum. Well, predicting is not my, uh, my, how shall I say, my speciality. So maybe I would skip this, you know, question about prediction. On uh, uh, Russia, uh, Russia in Europe, Russia in the West, I think it's, it's, it's very uneven. It's very controversial per se. On the one hand, Russia did it best to send a message of uh, kind of, you know, friendship to Italy with some kind of, uh, I guess, hidden expectations that uh, these countries that have been helped by Russia, they might at certain point lift, uh, uh, you know, so or at least raise the issue of lifting sanctions, which did not happen. So, in fact, this strategy does not work. Russia invests its resources, but after Russia sent its humanitarian mission to Italy, uh, sanctions have been prolonged for another year by the European Union. And sanctions is uh, the most uh, painful uh, element of all the whole set of relations between Russia and the European Union. And Russia is really investing a lot in finding, you know, mechanisms that might be helpful at a certain point in raising sanctions. Russia did not, uh, let's say, acquire, did not get new friends. Uh, I mean, this have been pro-Russian, they remain pro-Russian. In, uh, in the European Union or in the US. So I don't think that Russia, Russia have got new, uh, new allies. So it's more or less, uh, more or less like that. Uh, I would say that this um, uh, so-called uh, humanitarian mission in Italy was very short 
and the results should not be projected uh, too, I mean, uh, too much to, uh, uh, toward the future. Uh, and what is uh, increasingly problematic is that you know that border with Russia is closed for the European Union, including the country in which I live in, in Estonia. I mean, for border countries, I mean, this, this, might be, this might be problematic because it's a disruption of the normal uh, mobility and the inflows, outflows, etc. But the European Union is not uh, even considering opening border with Russia in the nearest future. So the Schengen area is more or less, you know, uh, restored, not to the full extent, but at least you can travel to most mm -hmm. destinations, even if it's about, you know, going through the qu uh, quarantine procedure, still, you, if, if you need, you can travel. This is not the case of opening the border with Russia. So I think this is a kind of a test case. And the European Union, uh, the, the reason why the European Union is not rushing uh, to open the, reopen the border is that they don't believe the figures and numbers of Russian statistics, and they don't know whether the Russian statistics reflect the real state of affairs, or it's just something that is like, you know, uh, visual thinking. And Russia, I think, Russia only strengthened its reputation of a country that manipulates with statistics. Statistics of, of uh, election, statistics of people's voting, statistics of uh, uh, infected people. So Russia and statistics is kind of very problematic relations. And now this is not just an abstract issue. This is a very specific issue because if the European Union does not believe in Russian statistics, they would not hurry up with opening the border with Russia. With all the economic and uh, people related uh, consequences of that. So in this sense, I don't see that Russia gained too much uh, so far uh, with this humanitarian diplomacy and uh, with this attempt to find a new, let's say, uh, common language with the European Union on dealing with global threats together. Thank you, Andre. Uh, again, we I think we are running out of time, but I would like to thank uh, Andre Bakarichev so much for for his insight in this uh, in this webinar. Uh, thank you for the other participant as well. I will not try to conclude because I think Andre's uh, uh, last remarks about the the this kind of uh, problematic situation. If we try to uh, predict what will happen in the not only in the referendum, but also in the what happened after the referendum. If, if, if well, if Putin, when Putin won the, the, the referendum, probably what will happen? Well, uh, will it change uh, Russia's uh, foreign policy towards mm -hmm. the region or or or, or towards other uh, great powers like the U.S. or China? That I think one question is actually asked about that. But again, I think uh, we could. Uh, thank Professor Andrei Makarichev for... Thank you very much for having me here with you. And we could have a group picture, I think. <laughs> That's Absolutely. what our, our tradition. So if all the participants could uh, turn on their video, so we could have a group picture. So we do have a, a lot of lecturers from, from my department, Andre. From mm -hmm. Very nice in, to see uh, all of them. So we have thank you, thank you, Santo pa, Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, the other, you turn on your videos as well, uh, Mr. Johannes, uh, Bu Baik, Wardani. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but Olifatus, could would you? Okay. So let's see if uh, okay, Mr. Johannes, could you take the pictures? Uh, Please hold your your post for about five seconds. Okay. One, two, uh, five seconds times two. Five, uh, one, two, three. Okay. And another one. Mm -hmm. Wait. Uh, one, two, three. Okay. 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 Uh, thank you so much good. for attending the for attending thank our you. discussion. Uh, our next session uh, next week will talk about something a bit different. So we will talk about China uh, hegemonic uh, identity in the region uh, with uh, one of the IR professor uh, Ted Hoff from National University of Singapore. So uh, if you could join us again uh, next week, that would be uh, a, a very good uh, situation. Then thank you, Andre, again. Uh, thank you.
once again, thank you for, uh, for joining us and for sharing your thoughts on this. Thank you very much, colleagues, for your active participation and for your questions that really helped me a lot in, you know, kind of expanding my horizons and, you know, drawing these parallels with, uh, with other countries. I think it was very important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's hope we can meet again in the next Absolutely. session. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll end the meeting. Bye. Bye. Bye.